Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Not in my usual office space because there's a bunch of people with chainsaws next to that right now. But uh, I want to record a Deep Space update, a collection of smaller stories which perhaps deserve some attention and maybe not an entire video in and of themselves. So we're going to start with the SLS Green Run having successfully completed almost 500 seconds of uh, test firing yesterday. That is the uh, SLS Core Booster ran through, you know, all, yeah, almost 500 seconds of awesome fire and fury and spicy gimbal action demonstrating that the core booster is ready to go. Uh, it sounds like NASA have already declared a success and are talking about it being at uh, the Cape as soon as next month, ready to get mated with the two solid rocket boosters, which are already stacked and their uh, warranty is now ticking down. So we know that there needs to be an SLS launch within the year or they have to take everything apart. Uh, so yeah, everything looks fine. There was some burning on the back of the rocket, which is attributed to extra cork insulation that was added because during this test, they are doing the whole thing at sea level, Whereas, of course, they wouldn't need that if they were doing a real flight since the air gets thinner as they go up. Anyway, that's all big news. Great to see. Simultaneously, down in Boca Chica, SpaceX were, success were stacking uh, the two halves of their first test booster, BN-1, 72 meters tall. Uh, basically the same height as a Falcon 9, but this is the, the booster stage. Now... Elon has already confirmed that this booster is probably is, isn't going to fly. It's going to be a pathfinder that they're going to use for you know moving around, showing that they can shift this from the supply from the construction area to the launch site. You know, checking out the probably the engine attachment procedures and the plumbing, all that stuff. It's not going to fly. It, maybe they'll do a pressure test which means, you know, it might actually fly by accident, but hopefully not. So that's moving forwards. But I guess the biggest news for NASA in the coming four years is the fact that the new NASA administrator has officially been nominated, and it's Bill Nelson with Pam Melroy as uh, assistant administrator. Now, Bill Nelson, yeah, he's a politician. And in fact, a few years ago, when Bridenstine was nominated... He actually said politicians shouldn't be running NASA, and now he's in the same position, uh, and he's probably changed his position on that. I mean, like, to be clear, politicians change their positions all the time. Bridenstine famously said a lot of stuff to get voted uh, into Congress, and then stopped saying that when he had a chance to be NASA administrator. So, yeah, we're probably seeing the same kind of thing happen from Bill. Now, Bill does actually have spaceflight experience. He was a congressman, and NASA put him on a space shuttle in January of 1986. He flew as a mission specialist uh, in on Columbia. Uh, this was, like, the last shuttle flight before the Challenger disaster. Also on that shuttle flight was Charles Bolden, who went on to be NASA administrator uh, nominated by Obama. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, that was also interesting because that was the first flight of Columbia after it had been refitted from its early test flights. So, yeah, um, I, I don't know what this is really going to do long term for NASA. There's a lot of people like, so first of all, this is a politics thing and there'll be people pointing out, oh, wow, well, this nomination came so much earlier, obviously, th than the Biden Bridenstine one. So this is a good sign. And simultaneously, there'll be people on the other side saying, oh, look at how much he loves SLS, because he, of course, campaigned for that early on. On the other hand, he hasn't, you know, he's sort of distanced himself over time from SLS because he was a Florida politician, so he was more interested in launch vehicles. He wasn't interested in specific launch vehicles, and he went head-to-head -head with Shelby over, like, commercial crew not getting the funding that it needed. So... Yeah, I, I can't say he's certainly not going to be as dynamic or as fun or as open as Bridenstine, but, you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes. Pam Melroy, by the way, a lot of respect for her. She's a, you know, U.S. Air Force. She was a shut in the shuttle three times, twice as pilot, once as commander. Um, your degrees in physics and astronomy and master's in planetary science. And she was also a deputy admin for DARPA. So she has real chops that, you know, respect for that. Okay, 
Moving on, because I don't want this to be all about politics. I actually want to come back to some previous stories that we've covered, because, you know, sometimes we don't get follow-ups. So we've had three SpaceX failures I've sort of covered in some level of detail. And the first one was SN9. Since that happened, if you remember, it came down and one of the engines failed to relight properly. You saw throwing out gas. I've, I've since had information on that that confirms that it was the engine's problem and that it was the oxygen pre-burner that failed to light. So therefore, that side of the pressurization system wasn't running and they couldn't get it up to speed so the engine didn't start properly. And this was a Raptor problem. For SN10, we actually have official confirmation from Elon about what happened there. So if you remember, I it, it came down fast and bumped. I estimated it was like over 7 meters per second. Elon says 10 meters per second impact speed. So, you know, I'll, I'll take that. But the control system was commanding higher thrust from the single engine at that time. And the single engine didn't deliver the thrust required. That's why it didn't decelerate and land properly. Uh, it seems that blame is being placed on the helium pressurization system where bubbles were getting into the, the fuel because, uh, of course, when it's doing these rotations, it causes the fuel to get stirred up. And these bubbles, they were carried down the fuel system and that meant that the propellant that was being delivered was lower density and so they couldn't get enough propellant into the engine to generate the pressures needed for the higher throttles. And... If you remember, the helium pressurization system is something that Elon pushed for when they had problems with the first flight with the autogenous pressurization system. And Elon has basically said, yeah, that was a bad idea. And he sort of said he pushed it. It was his fault. The difference is, I guess, that helium, when it gets very cold, it will remain a gas. But if you have bubbles of methane or oxygen from an autogenous pressurization system, those will essentially collapse and dissolve into the liquid. So it's that, that wouldn't have happened in this case. Okay, so the Starlink booster, I don't remember which one, that it failed during the entry burn and then it was seen to continue burning. We have had some more information on that. There's some clues that were dropped during a NASA presentation that suggested that the center engine actually failed during ascent. Uh, we would sort of got some clue that there was some blips in the acceleration curve that might have suggested the failure there. But then they also said that the actual failure was related to the thermal protection boot. That is the flexible seal between the nozzle, because the nozzle can gimbal and move, and the base of the rocket. And there was a hole in that that let hot gases get in, presumably during the entry burn that caused uh, then a fire or uncontrolled damage. And ultimately, it's believed that the rocket may have continued burning all the way down until it hit the water. So... I sort of have a theory on this that during ascent, if the engine shut down, then you've got a lot, you've got a bunch of engines around it and they're generating hot gas, and that might have meant more heat on the way up, and then ultimately more heat on the way down, which meant put more pressure on the boot. So we don't know for sure, but it seems that this was confirmed to be a center engine failure by all the sources that I've seen. Um, in the coming weeks, so Back to operational stuff. Space Station, there's a lot going on up there that's worth talking about. First of all, the Crew-2 spacecraft, Crew two spacecraft uh, mission, Dragon, they are scheduled for launch on April 22nd, uh, although for a while it was going to be April 20th, but then lots of people were making 420 jokes, including me. Uh, it seems that Boeing's Starliner has been delayed a little because the one chance they had to get to the station be, the, because they need to dock at a common, at a sorry, one of the PMAs, the, the or the international docking adapters, they their one chance to get up there was between Cargo Dragon coming home and Crew Two going up, and it seems they're going to miss that, so they're going to have to wait a lot longer before Starliner can get a test flight to the space station in. Um. Over on Soyuz, it's been revealed that Mark van der Hey will fly on Soyuz MS-18. And, you know, while 
astronauts from NASA flying on Soyuz had been common in the past, this one is particularly odd. So the spare seat on the Soyuz was essentially licensed by Axiom Space. They wanted to find a space tourist to take that seat. And NASA then stepped in and said, could we have that seat? And we'll then give Axiom a seat on a NASA commercial crew mission for you know, to do what they will. And, and I guess this makes complete sense from NASA's point of view because Mark van der Hey trained as a backup for Kate Rubens, who's currently on the space station. And so, yeah, he spent all that time training. If you can put him on a Soyuz, that's great. Then it, you save a lot of training time. Uh, he might actually have an extended stay on the space station because Soyuz MS-19 is, it's being said that that will carry a film director and an actress. And those, because they're going only for a short flight, they will fly up on MS-19 and then fly down on MS-18. And they'll need a commander on that. So that means that Mark will have to stay behind for a much longer duration mission in space. So this, of course, this Russian space movie is, it's sort of another case of Roscosmos and um, Dmitry Rogozin sort of trying to one-up NASA and, and do something, announce something. You, you'll see this a lot where they announce something and then nothing comes off it. But in this, one, this case, they have all the stuff in place. So it's probably quite easy for them to get to space and make a movie and beat Tom Cruise's movie, which is uh, probably happening next year. Although, you know, if you're talking about first movies in space, just remember that Richard Garriott actually shot a movie while on the space station, although it wasn't nearly the high quality production that we're going to expect. It is a fascinating artifact of a space tourist flying. Uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's just a whole bunch of random stuff worth talking about. We'll get back to regular service soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>